Seriously, how could a grain of pollen change the world? Well, it sure did. In 1827, Robert Brown, England's premier botanist before Charles Darwin, was studying the pollination of plants when he noticed something strange going on under his microscope. A grain of pollen was jiggling around in a drop of water. Brown curiously watched the grain of pollen through his microscope for a long time, and it never stopped jiggling. It kept shaking and shuddering. There was no pattern to it at all, just random, continuous, zigzag jiggling. He couldn't figure out why. Robert Brown tried diligently to figure it out. Brown tried changing the temperature of the droplet that the pollen grain was suspended in. He cooled it. The pollen grain zigzagged less. He heated the water droplet, and it zigzagged more. Brown wrote a paper about it, and none of the scientists who read his article could figure it out either. The mysterious invisible cause of Brownian motion defied a solution. Science was stumped. An explanation was offered. Some scientists suggested that the energy of the water was making it move, but there was no proof. Proof is essential for science, or else everything is just science fiction. And since no proof could be given for why the pollen grain continued to jiggle around, scientists decided to just forget about it. The pollen grain was too tough for them. For 75 years, science more or less ignored the unexplained problem of the grain of pollen zigzagging around until Albert Einstein took particular notice of it. There must be some explanation for these pollen grain dancing this jitterbug dance. I'll just put a glass of water on my desk, add a few grains of pollen from the flower, and see if I can figure out what is happening. Invisible phenomena can be fundamental, gravity, magnetism, and whatever it is. Ah, but what if it's not some invisible energy that we physicists have never heard of before? The simpler, the better, I always say. Maybe the pollen grain is not dancing. Maybe it's being pushed around and shoved here, thereby something too small to see, even in a microscope. Ah, let me think. To make a physical formula, I will first need to decide what I want to solve. If I can predict the distance the pollen grain will move, I can calculate its invisible pusher's strength. But since the motion is random, my prediction must be relative to all conditions. Everything is relative. Aha! I am beginning to see a formula coming into view on my forward view screen. Ah, they don't have view screens yet, but they will. Oh, where is my pencil? Aha! This is what I have come up with. Isn't it lovely? Flashing his brilliant genius at combining a large variety of physics formulae, Einstein showed that a particle which was moving randomly when suspended in water, the pollen grain, obeyed statistical laws of motion dependent on the viscosity of the water, the temperature of the water, the distance the particle moved, the mass and size of the individual pollen grain, its velocity, and the duration of the time of motion. Einstein's novel statistical approach to fluid mechanics enabled a computational reduction to yield a figure for the mass of a single H2O water molecule, and eventually for the hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Brownian motion was solved, and Einstein opened the 20th century to the world of the atom. The overlooked, jiggling, trivial grain of pollen pointed the way to the proof of atoms. That grain of pollen deserved a Nobel Prize. Statistical analysis of random events has become an essential tool in various scientific applications. With an understanding of Brownian motion, random fluctuations, science can finally get a quantitative grip on weather phenomena, game theory, traffic flow, stock market fluctuations, even human cell function, to name just a few applications of Einstein's statistical theory. All thanks to a tireless grain of pollen. And yet, there was still another oddity that science had chosen to forget about that caught the intense attention of Albert Einstein. The planet Mercury was doing something that nobody could explain. Over 200 years before the dawn of the 20th century, Sir Isaac Newton published his Universal Law of Gravity. It really should be called Newton's Theory of Gravity, not a law, because Einstein was going to supplant Newtonian gravity with his new theory of gravity. As soon as Einstein could figure out the unexplained mystery of the planet Mercury's orbital peculiarity, Newton revealed the formula for gravitational attraction between two masses. With Newton's mathematical explanation of gravity, 
Science now knew why the planets orbited the sun. In contrast, before Newton, science only knew that the planets orbited the sun, but didn't know the why. Astronomers after Newton jumped merrily into recalculating the orbits of the known planets according to Newton's theory of gravitation and checking their calculations against careful observations of the planets with telescopes. Except that the planet Mercury wasn't cooperative. As I'll explain after a brief digression, Mercury wasn't precisely obeying Sir Isaac Newton's mathematical formula. In the early years after Newton, the 1750s and beyond, there were only six known planets, the visible planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. No additional planets or asteroids had at this time been yet discovered by telescope. And then, something genuinely unusual occurred, for which science still has no explanation. In the late 1760s and early 1770s, two German astronomers published a simple numeral series that located the orbital paths of all the known planets, and some unknown ones too. Johann Daniel Tidius and Johann Ellert Bode published this mathematical rubric. Add the number 4 to each of the following numbers in this progressive series. 0, 3, 6, 12, 24, 48, 96, 192. Then divide each sum by 10. Voila! You get the orbital paths of the planets in the solar system in astronomical units. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is considered one astronomical unit. It's a useful approximation and is a convenient standard of measurement. Earth is the third planet, so you take the third number of the series, 6, add 4, and divide by 10. You get one astronomical unit, called an AU. Let's try Jupiter. That's number 48 in the Tidius Boda series. 48 plus 4 equals 52. Divided by 10 is 5.2 astronomical units. And that's exactly where the orbital path of Jupiter lies from the Sun. Does it work for Saturn, too? Let's try it. 96 plus 4 equals 100. Divided by 10 equals 10 AUs from the Sun. 10 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. That's where Saturn orbits. The Tidius Boda law works. The pattern is correct. Astronomers quickly noted a number between Mars and Jupiter, one after Saturn. The Tidius Boda rubric inspired William Herschel's search for and discovery of the planet Uranus in 1781 and the discovery of the first asteroid, Ceres, in 1801 by Giuseppe Piazzi. That's a strangely accurate little numerical progression. The Tidius Boda law is being used today to predict the location of Saturn's moons, Uranus's moon system, and even to indicate the location of exoplanets around other stars, even though no one knows why it works. It looks like a good mystery for a young new Einstein to solve. But I digress. What's that about Mercury? Mercury was doing something that didn't compute with Newtonian gravity. The perihelion point of Mercury's orbit, that's the place where a planet is closest to the Sun, was moving forward a little bit every year. It was noticeable and unaccounted for by Newton's gravitational formula. Unless there was another planet in the inner solar system affecting Mercury's orbit. The search for a planet inside Mercury's orbit had begun. Calculations of its potential orbit were distributed worldwide. And the name was already picked out, Vulcan. Telescopes worldwide searched the skies at dawn and sunset, looking for Vulcan near to the Sun. But no planet inside Mercury's orbit was ever found. Vulcan just didn't exist. Sorry, Mr. Spock. Science was stumped again. The anomalous precession forward of the perihelion point of Mercury's orbit remained a mystery without an explanation for over 50 years. Until one day, when Einstein was having coffee at an outdoor cafe with his co-worker at the patent office in Bern, Switzerland. Michaela Besso had been a classmate of Einstein's and would be his lifelong friend. I don't like things that don't add up. Neither do I, Albert. The forward precession of Mercury's perihelion point doesn't add up. Please give me the sugar. Well, it's not Vulcan. <laughs> no, it's not Vulcan. But what is it? Albert, you keep trying to solve all your problems with physics. Why don't you take an engineering approach? How do you mean? If you look at the solar system as a physical construction, there could be an answer. Okay, Michaela, I am following you. If I trace my finger around the rim of my empty coffee cup, the pathway is circular. 
But if I stuff this napkin into the cup and make a cone, like this, then an elliptical orbit inside the cone will tend to process forward. My gosh! Space is not flat! Later, bring Nikela another cup of coffee. You are going to have to do a bunch of new calculations, Albert. Ah, yeah, I've got to be going. Later, hold that cup of coffee. See you later, Michaela. <laughs> okay, Albert, good luck. When Einstein published his special theory of relativity in 1905, he credited Michaela Besso for his invaluable contribution. Just recently, the letters that Michaela Besso and Einstein exchanged in the years before Einstein published his general theory of relativity in 1915 were sold at auction for $13 million. You might want to keep safe those letters and texts from your best friend. They might become valuable someday. Traveling at about 17,000 miles per hour, 250 miles above the Earth, astronauts watch 16 sunrises and sunsets every day while floating around in a box with a handful of people they depend on for survival. Whether humans should set off to other worlds beyond Earth or not, one of the most compelling drawbacks is this. Our bodies don't like it. Few people know this better than the NASA astronaut who spent nearly a year on the International Space Station from 2015 to 2016, Scott Kelly. Like other astronauts, Mr. Kelly served as a test subject in the study of space travel's effects on the human body. Unlike other astronauts, Mr. Kelly has an identical twin, Mark, who is an astronaut himself. This gave researchers an uncommon opportunity to monitor the two brothers as they lived in two very different environments, one on Earth and the other 250 miles above it. When the astronaut went into space and his slightly older twin brother Mark stayed on Earth, the age gap between them increased thanks to his time in orbit. And it's all down to Einstein's theory of relativity. What it suggests is that time moves more slowly for objects in motion than it does for a stationary observer. It also moves more slowly the closer you are to a gravitational mass like Earth. In other words, we're not all experiencing time at the same rate. The faster you move and accelerate, the more time slows down. And because Mr. Kelly has been zooming up to and down from space and orbiting the planet at around 17,500 miles per hour, his brother Mark has lived through 0.005 extra seconds. The brothers were born six seconds apart back in 1964, and now that gap is 6.005 seconds. This warping of time is known as time dilation and the Kelly brothers qualify for both aspects of it. How fast they've been moving in relation to one another and how close they are to a big object, which is Earth. So, depending on our position and speed, time can appear to move faster or slower to us relative to others in a different part of space-time. And for astronauts on the International Space Station, that means they get to age just a tiny bit slower than people on Earth. That doesn't mean you could spend your life in a basement just to outlive the rest of us here on the surface. The effect isn't noticeable on such a small scale. If you became a basement hermit, then across your entire lifetime, you'd only age a fraction of a second slower than everyone else above ground. But your brain might freeze when you think about this. A watch strapped to your ankle will eventually fall behind one strapped to your wrist. Your head technically ages more quickly than your feet. Time passes faster for people living on a mountain than those living at sea level. The classic example for this is the twin scenario. One twin blasts off in a spaceship, traveling close to the speed of light, and the other stays behind on Earth. When the space-traveling twin returns to Earth, she's only aged a couple of years. But she's shocked to find that her Earth-bound sister has aged over a decade. Of course, no one has performed that experiment in real life, but there's evidence that it's real. When scientists launched an atomic clock into orbit and back, while keeping an identical clock here on Earth, it returned running ever so slightly behind the Earth-bound clock. Then time gets even more complicated, because time dilation can happen any time. A good way to think about it is to consider the astronauts living on the International Space Station. They're floating about 260 miles above, where Earth's gravitational pull is weaker than it is at the surface. That means time should speed up for them relative to the people on the ground. But the space station is also whizzing around Earth at about nearly 5 miles per second. That means time should also slow down for the astronauts relative to people on the surface. But the reality is that Mark, 
the brother who's aged a few milliseconds longer could end up better off in the long run if Mr. Kelly's extended time in space causes his body to deteriorate faster. Ten science teams in NASA's twin study examined the brother's astronauts before, during, and after the astronaut's 340 days in space. The teams studied each twin's bodily functions, they ran memory tests, and they examined the men's genes, looking what differences might be due to space travel. They confirmed that lengthy space travel stresses the human body in many ways. Space living can change genes and send the immune system into overdrive. It can dull mind and memory. Most changes that the astronaut experienced in space reversed once he returned to Earth, but not everything. The researchers tested him again after six months back on land. Roughly 91% of the genes that had changed activity in space were now back to normal. The rest stayed in space mode. His immune system, for instance, remained on high alert. DNA repair genes were still overly active and some of his chromosomes were still topsy-turvy. What's more, the astronaut's mental abilities had declined from pre-flight levels. He was slower and less accurate on short-term memory and logic tests. It's unclear whether these results are definitely from spaceflight. That's partly because the observations are from only one person. But one thing is sure, time is relative. Think of it this way. If a clock is stationary and you are traveling at a very high speed, you happen to pass by this clock and have a glimpse at it, you'll see that it's running slowly, or maybe it's completely static. This is because the speed at which the mechanical functions of the clock are working slower than you. What you see is the time in the past, while you have already skipped that second and are in the future. During this experiment of high-speed traveling, you haven't aged at all, because all the processes in your body are working at the same speed as you. After a certain age, your body starts to deteriorate, which eventually leads to a state when it stops functioning. This aging phenomenon, especially in humans, is caused by a protein structure in the cells called telomeres. These structures protect our cells from deteriorating, but with each cell replication, these telomeres start to lose strength, which is called telomere length. If the telomere length shortens to a certain extent, the cell becomes vulnerable to diseases. We can say that telomeres are the natural countdown timers in our bodies, which determine when we will expire. The telomere length can be affected by external factors like stress, which accelerates our timer. The twin study experiment by NASA included documenting the changes in telomere length of both brothers. The telomere length of the space brother increased while he was aboard the International Space Station. Before the mission, both brothers had nearly the same telomere lengths. Meaning if we ignore issues like mental stress, both brothers should live roughly an equal age. But while the space brother was orbiting the Earth, he had almost 14.5% longer telomere length. The space brother was a few years younger than his ground brother biologically. Because the telomere length of the space brother resumed to normal when he came back to Earth, it took almost 190 days after return for the telomere length to restore to expected. The blood samples from the International Space Station were sent back to Earth for processing. This means the blood wasn't traveling at the speed of the ISS anymore. Also, the space-time paradox states that the space brother should be younger upon return. But the telomere length restored to its original state before the mission. The space brother was again the same age as his ground brother. A lack of gravity is the main cause for these intense changes in aging. Gravity plays an immense role in the majority of our bodily systems. Take the muscles for example. Older people's muscles tend to shrink and decline as they age and become less mobile. Astronauts' muscles react in a similar way because they are barely used. That's why astronauts staying in space for extended periods of time use special exercise machines to help reduce this effect. A similar process takes place in the bones. After a certain age, people on Earth start to lose mass in their bones, typically at a rate of about 1-2% to a year. But in space, those people lose bone mass at a greatly accelerated rate, as much as 1-2% to a month. Because the astronauts' bodies don't need to support their weight, the bones begin to decrease production of new bone material and increase the amount of old bone absorption. Luckily, their skeletal systems usually return to normal once they've spent some time back on our blue planet. 
If the Space Brother was shielded from all harms of space, like radiations, while orbiting the ISS, then he would have lived longer than his ground brother. Even though they're saving 0.005 seconds, astronauts still experience some of the symptoms of a drawn-out aging process. So the next time you find yourself wishing the weekend would last longer, stay low to the ground and move really fast. It won't feel like your weekend got any longer, but technically, you may gain a teeny tiny fraction of a second. You won't need to go to space for this little experiment. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are the richest people in the world at the moment. But if you put all their money together, this amount won't be anywhere near the wealth of the richest person in history. Meet Mansa Musa, the richest man who ever lived. He has held first place in the top riches for more than 700 years, and it's unlikely that somebody will be able to reach his wealth level in the near future. Jeff Bezos has about $203 billion. Elon Musk owns more than $300 billion. Mansa Musa, translated into today's money, had an incalculable wealth. The most conservative estimates suggest that he had more than $400 to $500 billion. However, this is only a hypothesis. Most historians believe he was unimaginably rich and powerful, and this wealth destroyed his country's economy. But let's start from the beginning. Mansa Musa was born in 1280 in West Africa, in the country of Mali, the present-day Republic of Mali. His whole family consisted of rulers, so he spent his childhood and youth in luxury. Almost all this time, his elder brother ruled the country. And then, when Mansa Musa turned 32, his brother abdicated. He wanted to explore the world and was obsessed with the Atlantic Ocean and the lands that lay beyond it. He assembled a huge expedition of 2,000 ships and tens of thousands of people. They sailed like a whole city on the water and never came back. Some historians believe that Mansa Musa's brother managed to reach South America, but there is no true evidence of this. So, young Mansa Musa became the ruler of Mali and the owner of all the family wealth in 1312. He was a good ruler and a smart strategist. In the first years of his reign, he managed to annex about 24 cities. He united disparate small states into one empire. He greatly expanded the kingdom of Mali. It extended about 2,000 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. He owned almost the entire western part of the continent. From that moment on, the wealth of Mansa Musa began to grow enormously. In the medieval world, gold was considered the most valuable source of wealth on the entire planet. Many historians believe that Mansa Musa owned almost half of all available reserves of gold in the world at that time. They arranged thousands of trading centers for gold and other valuable goods like salt in Mali. And part of all this large-scale trade profit went directly into the pocket of Mansa Musa. He had everything, money, power, and servants. But there was something he desperately lacked. His desire was similar to his brother's. Mansa Musa also wanted to travel, not to discover the world, but to glorify his empire. He wanted fame. Only a few people heard of his powerful kingdom abroad, but he knew that his country was almost the richest in the whole world. To achieve what he wanted, Mansa Musa went on a pilgrimage to Mecca through the Sahara Desert and Egypt. This trip was one of the greatest anyone had ever undertaken. Mansa Musa set on his journey with a caravan consisting of about 60,000 people. He was accompanied by the entire royal court, all the officials, thousands of soldiers, artists, camel drivers, merchants, and tens of thousands of servants. They took a long flock of goats and sheep for food. It was a huge city wandering through the desert. Just imagine the amount of water and food needed to feed this crowd. As soon as the king announced a halt, long tent camps were set up. It would take you a whole day to walk around this territory. Thousands of people worked on cooking food. Artists were playing on stage. Merchants were offering their goods to people inside the camp or to travelers passing by. Servants took care of the animals and helped with household issues. All this was happening under the scorching sun on the hot sand. And then they had to fold the tent city back to get on the road again. Most likely, not everyone managed to survive such a journey. But the good news was that Mansa Musa treated his people very well. Almost all of these people were dressed in the best Persian silk and fabrics woven from gold threads. 
Hundreds of camels were pulling loads with hundreds of thousands of pounds of pure gold. There was so much gold that you could see it shining in the sun from afar. No one was ever hungry or thirsty. There were enough supplies for a comfortable trip. The travelers passing by were amazed by the scale and beauty of the huge royal expedition. Rumors of the approaching King of Mali reached Cairo before the king himself. Finally, Mansa Musa's caravan arrived in Cairo. The locals were shocked by all that luxury and wealth, but the coolest thing was that the ruler generously shared it with people. The gold he gave them made many poor people rich. He stayed in Cairo for three months. Gold was everywhere, and that's why it lost its value. It made no sense to sell goods for gold when everyone had it. That's how Mansa Musa lowered the price of gold and destroyed the country's economy during his stay in Cairo. According to estimates of modern economists and historians, the crisis he caused led to losses of about $1.5 billion in the Middle East. When he realized what he had done, he tried to help the economy. One theory says that he wasn't able to do it because he had spent all the money. According to another story, he wanted to take some of the gold back from circulation. To do this, he attempted to borrow gold at huge interest rates from Egyptian lenders. He failed to restore the economy but reached his desirable goal. News and rumors about his wealth and generosity spread all over the world. An image of an African king sitting on a golden throne with a piece of gold in his hand appeared on the map of the Catalan Atlas of 1375. With this drawing, they designated Timbuktu, the major city of Mali, and the king sitting there was Mansa Musa. Here's some real stories mixed with legends about the city and its ruler. Some said it was impossible to count the amount of wealth that Mansa Musa owned. Others believed that he had enough gold to make every person on the planet rich. People from all over the world began to travel to Mali to see this place with their own eyes. Timbuktu had become an African El Dorado thanks to the mystery and legends. Many thought it was a golden city at the end of the world. European treasure hunters and explorers went on long, dangerous journeys to visit the kingdom but all this happened many years after the reign of Mansa Musa. He not only glorified his country and his name all over the world, but also returned to his homeland with new scientists, poets, and architects. He paid them hundreds of pounds of gold to convince them to move to Timbuktu. The amount he gave to each of them would be around $8 million in today's money. He started investing in education, arts, literature, architecture, and libraries. He built schools and colleges. During the reign of Mansa Musa, Timbuktu became a center of education. People from all over the world came here to get high quality knowledge. In 1337, Mansa Musa passed away at the age of 56. His sons inherited all his wealth, but they failed to keep their father's legacy. Many disputes, attempts to get more money, uprisings and intrigues all led to the collapse of the powerful kingdom small states divided. For hundreds of years, Mali had been losing its power. Then, Europeans came to this territory, and it finally destroyed the empire. That's why so little is known about the royal dynasty of Mansa Musa today. The history of the Middle Ages is mainly viewed from the West. And in the West, just a few people heard of Mali during the reign of Mansa Musa. If Europeans had visited the kingdom more in its prime, at the peak of military and economic power, Mansa Musa would have become much more famous, and the kingdom's glory would have stretched for many centuries. But the Europeans were about 200 years too late. They found the country during a severe crisis and uprisings. It's still impossible to calculate how rich he was. Perhaps nobody else will ever be able to reach this level. If the Mansa Musa dynasty lived up to today and kept the empire, we'd probably live in a completely different world. Africa could be the richest and most developed continent in the world, and Mali would be its center. The kingdom would achieve all this peacefully. Mansa Musa was generous and preferred to conquer countries with luxury, not force. Hello, brave visitor, and welcome to the exhibition of the uncanny. But beware! This is going to be one chilling experience for you. Even Sabrina the Witch couldn't handle these photos. Now, if you've got what it takes to jump into the tunnel of oddities, let's begin. 
The first photo will take you back to 1900s Belfast. It shows 15 females who were workers at a linen mill. If you calculate how many hands 15 people have, it makes 30, right? But take a good look at the photo, and you'll see there's an extra hand that doesn't belong to any of the ladies there. All the women are arranged in rows with their arms crossed over their chests and hands tucked underneath their arms. There is only one exception to that, and it's the lady in the second row with one hand on her hip and the other down by her side. That's one little rebel you got there. But the mysterious claw-like hand is neither hers nor does it belong to someone close to her. It's actually resting on the shoulder of a girl on the other side of the same row. And there's no one else who the hand could belong to. (laughs) Even though it's a century old, the photograph first appeared on the internet on April 29, 2016. It was sent to one website by a woman named Linda, who identified the girl with a hand on her shoulder as her grandmother, Ellen Donnelly. But she never commented on who that hand might belong to. What's even weirder is that there's no evidence whatsoever that suggests that the photo was digitally altered. So where did this lonely hand come from? Photoshop didn't exist back then. But this doesn't mean photographers didn't have the necessary skills to edit their photos. Although it was not possible to add an extra hand to the photo, it was surely possible to remove any unwanted objects or people by simply cutting them out with scissors. Photographers would then draw what they wanted to be in the picture in pencil or charcoal. They could also combine multiple negatives to create a single image. There's one more answer to where the hand could have come from. Even though instantaneous photography had already existed in the 1900s, some photographers still use the long exposure technique to capture the moment. So it is possible that while the photo was being taken, the lady in the back initially placed her hands on Ellen and then decided to cross her arms, which makes this terrifying photo the result of long camera exposure. So you can ease your mind that it was not Thing, the hand that lived with the Adams family, that photobombed this picture. (coughs) Now in our second photo, you'll see a young lady holding a glowing apparition between her hands. It might also make it easy for you to believe that magic is real. But sorry to disappoint you, because that is not the Expellerama spell she's doing. The woman in the photo is French-born Martha Beron who later changed her name to Eva Carrera. She lived between 1886 and 1943. She was a fraudulent medium. She claimed to have psychic abilities that allowed her to communicate with people who had passed over to the other side and make their spirits materialize during her seances. At the time, such lying mediums would follow a standard procedure during their seances. They would enter a closet installed in the room to pretend to concentrate. Then, they could use their powers at full capacity to generate ectoplasm. When not used in the context of cell biology, ectoplasm is a term referring to an imaginary substance that would come out of the body of the medium. It then might take the shape of a face, a hand, or even the entire body of the person who's being called back to life. Eva Carrera was one of those dishonest mediums who would use chewed paper and cut out faces from magazines and newspapers to make fake ectoplasm. This photo of hers, taken in 1912 by German parapsychological researcher Albert von schrenk nosing shows her in action during one of such deceptive seances. But knowing the full story doesn't change the fact that this photo can make your hair stand on end. But what's even more unbelievable than the photo itself is the fact that she was able to convince big names like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes mystery series, that she was the real thing. But you'll be happy to know that she couldn't trick illusionist and escape artist Harry Houdini, who, unlike Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, thought her performances were nothing more than a magician's tricks. Now, these owls in the third photo are not Hogwarts owls, and they are not here to bring you your acceptance letter. 
This photo was taken in the 1920s outside the Manchester Grammar School, which was founded all the way back in 1515 by a man named Hugh Oldham. And he is the reason why these people are wearing weird owl costumes as they're marching. Hugh Oldham was born in Manchester. He wasn't a serious scholar, despite attending both Oxford and Cambridge universities. Well, the tuition was cheaper then. However, he was in royal service, and thanks to his administrative skills, he was favored with important titles. That is what actually helped him reach high positions and become a powerful and influential figure. And through his new duties, he was able to achieve great wealth, which he later used to fund the school. The motto of Oldham School, which is written on its coat of arms, is the Latin phrase sapere ode, which loosely translates to dare to be wise. To this day, the school still has that same motto, but the choice of the owl doesn't symbolize wisdom as you might think. The owl on the Manchester Grammar School's badge is carrying a banner with the word dome on it. If you read it as one would read emojis, you would arrive at Owldom, which is actually a reference to Hugh Oldham. When you look at the crest of the town of Oldham, you'll see it's very similar to that of the school. This choice was made to reflect the pronunciation of Oldham in the local accent, which is Owldom. Accordingly, paying respects to their founding father is why both the school's and the town's mascot is the owl. So rest assured that nothing sinister and spooky is going on in this photo. Now, how about something sweet after all that eerie stuff? The fourth photo depicts an innocent child whose eyes are screaming, help me! But don't worry, the boogeyman is not the one holding him. The thing he seems to be sitting on is actually his mother. This is called hidden mother photography, and it was actually very common in the Victorian era. Back in the 1840s, the only way people could have their photos taken was with a daguerreotype camera, which was the first photographic camera developed for commercial use. These cameras had exposure times from tens of seconds to several minutes. So one had to stay perfectly still during all that time to get a clear picture. But as you can imagine, it's not easy for a child, let alone me, to stay motionless for such a long period of time. And you can't say, strike a pose to a baby either. So this is the reason why the hidden mother technique was born. Children would be photographed with their mothers present. But mommy would also have to be hidden within the frame. To achieve that, they would often stand behind curtains, under cloaks or blankets, or act as chairs. Sometimes photographers would also remove parts of photographs where moms were visible. Wow, the hardships mothers have to go through for their children. Boy, that hasn't changed. Some of the photos turned out quite well but some of them ended up looking nightmarish. This practice continued to be used up until the 1920s. But as cameras became faster, there was no need for moms to hide anywhere. At least until photobombing became a thing. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. The legend goes that a dwarf named Fafnir was famous for his strength and courage. Because of his qualities, he was tasked with protecting their kingdom. Dwarves were known to gather a lot of wealth, so a bit of added security was a must. I mean, they lived in a house made from gold and precious gems. But Fafnir also had another special talent. He was able to shapeshift. Tricked by Loki, the Norse spirit of mischief, Fafnir was taken over by his greed and the shine of his father's treasure. He decided he did not want to share any of it, not even with his father or his brothers. He stole it and ran away all by himself to a place he'd be hard to find, the middle of the desert. To protect his wealth, Fafnir transformed into a huge dragon. His new appearance looked like a huge snake, powerful and scary. His magical powers did not end there, though. Because the dragon couldn't fly, he also spread poison all around his new home, so no one had a chance to survive if they wanted to take his gold away. 
Fafnir was soon defeated by a young hero named Sigurd. The legend of Fafnir tries to explain why family is more important than greed. It also shows the many magical powers dragons possess. But the most interesting part is that it's quite a good example of how dragons came to be in our tales. But hey, this is just one of the many stories mentioning dragons. Just switch on your TV or peek into any bookstore and you'll surely stumble upon dragons somewhere. Variations of dragon-like creatures have been described in stories from all over the world, from Asia to Northern Europe. Most of these creatures are depicted with reptile-like bodies, wings, and claws. And the scariest trait of them all, they can breathe fire out of their mouths. The name of these creatures comes from the Latin word draconum, which translates to huge serpent. But let's take a trip down memory lane to see how it all started. An Asian historian, for example, discovered some fossils back in the 4th century BCE and decided that he'd stumbled upon dragons. It's easy to understand why he got so confused if you look at a fossilized stegosaurus. It was 30 feet long, 14 feet tall, and covered in armored plates and spikes. The Nile crocodile might have gotten mistaken for a dragon too. It still exists today and lives in sub-Saharan Africa but it may have been more popular in ancient times. When reaching maturity, Nile crocodiles can grow up to 18 feet long. But that's not all. It can even walk with its body off the ground, and some were even pictured standing on their two back legs. Goannas are dragon-like lizards that live in Australia. Large as they are, they also have razor-sharp teeth and claws, and are also known to even produce venom. It's easy to see why goannas may be the source for the Australian version of dragons. When humans first discovered whale bones back in the day, we had no idea these animals lived in the sea. Given their size, we surely must have thought they were dangerous. And because we rarely see whales, if we don't go underwater of course, they were poorly understood and easily mistaken for dragons too. Probably the most interesting source of dragon mythology is actually the human brain. In a book called An Instinct for Dragons, there was a theory which claimed that dragons existed in almost all ancient cultures because we had evolved to fear large predators to survive. We aren't the only mammals to do this. Monkeys have an innate fear of snakes and large cats too, for example. When you combine these natural traits with folklore, you get a lot of dragon stories everywhere adapted to each region. Reptilian beasts with magical powers date back as far as the origins of human civilization itself. I'm talking about ancient Mesopotamia. Humans back then used to believe in all sorts of creatures, but their head spirit was Marduk, the patron of the city of Babylon. If you look at the artwork from back then, Marduk was depicted with a snake-like dragon at his side. It could be either nice or vengeful, depending on what mood it was in. If you want to sign up to become a dragon, the first thing they'll ask you at the interview will be if you can breathe fire, of course. So scientists have tried to look into some ways that could make it real for dragons to breathe out fire without damaging their throats. To do that, they examined the bombardier beetle. This eccentric insect can pack up some really hot substances in its belly. Once the creature gets bothered by something, it shoots out a fiery load of chemicals. In all fairness, it's not really fire, but it does burn, so it's close enough. Going back to dragons, they'd need to have similar glands in their throats to produce the same effect. But where do dragons come from? They didn't just appear out of nowhere, regardless of the source you consult. Some tales, like that of Fafnir, say that even humans can turn into dragons. But the most popular theory is that dragons start out as eggs. Some sources even draft a series of stages a dragon has to go through during its life. Everything starts with hatching. Dragons are said to eat their way out of those shells and break the sides of the egg. Then there's the wormling stage, which is what dragon specialists, or dragonologists if you like, call a newly hatched dragon. It's still small and weak, but don't worry, it can take care of itself pretty well. 
The rest of a dragon's life stages are pretty self-explanatory. There are grown-up dragons, then ancient ones. A dragon's life ends when it reaches the twilight stage. Some sources claim dragons never stopped growing. Others even say they never reach the end of their lives. They just pass on to another type of spiritual existence. Dragons are known to be the symbol of a lot of different things. But that all depends on their origin. In some regions of Asia, they are known to bring luck, power, and wealth. To become a powerful warrior in Britain, you'd need to first defeat a dragon. That's why you often see them on flags. The flag of Wales, for example, has a large red dragon on a green and white background. Western stories aren't as nice to dragons. They are often seen as evil and vengeful. Another myth associated with dragons is that they love gold and precious stones. This greedy side of their temperament seems to date back to ancient Greece, where dragons were tasked with guarding treasures. Some of these guarding dragons were seen in such tales as The Hobbit and in the Harry Potter series. As for dragons' magical abilities, they also vary a lot. Some were said to have blood with supernatural properties. Some were rumored to be able to speak. Others were famous for their wisdom. A lot of dragons in ancient literature could fly or shapeshift, even into humans. Some real-life creatures got their names thanks to bearing a resemblance to dragons, like the dragonfly that has more than 5,000 subspecies we know about. It got its name from folklore tales, as Europeans in the Middle Ages saw it as an evil insect. Dragonflies were accused of some really nasty things, like biting people's eyes and mouths. But the creature that resembles mythical dragons most is a reptile called the flying dragon. They're seen in wooded areas of Southeast Asia. They don't really have wings, per se, but parts of their ribs are elongated to support some extra skin that allows them to leap through the air between trees. Those wings are also brightly colored and contrast with their brown bodies. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Now think about it. Almost anywhere in the world, you'll be able to drink a cup of coffee. But how on earth did coffee become so popular among us human mammals? And what does it take for coffee to go all the way from a bean to the delicious java in our cups? Well, meet Carla. She comes from a Brazilian family that owns one of the most successful coffee farms in the world. She's going to show us around the farm and give us a behind-the-scenes look into the process of coffee production. By the way, do you even know what coffee is? Coffee is a fruit. It grows in medium-sized shrubs known as the coffea plant, just like the ones you see all over this place. The fruit itself is called a cherry because it's red in color. Carla is part of the team that picks cherries by hand since they mature at a different pace. She walks around with a large handmade basket and picks up to 55 pounds of cherries every day. If she's been picking cherries all morning, she'll pause to eat something sweet and appreciate her first cup of coffee of the day. Carla, like me and probably you, are part of 1 billion people around the world that love drinking coffee. That means we'll share something in common. Isn't that nice? Carla will drink her coffee while sitting on a lovely balcony overlooking the beautiful mountains of Minas Gerais. It's one of Brazil's biggest coffee-producing regions. Her family farm works with Arabica beans. These are beans usually sold in your local specialty coffee shop. They are superior quality beans with a richer flavor than the Robusta variety. Arabica beans are usually found at heights of 4,000 feet. To thrive, they need high altitudes and a drier climate. Thankfully, Carla's farm has all that Arabica beans need for a fantastic, delicious coffee. High altitudes allow coffee to have a richer taste, since the oxygen in these regions is scarcer and it takes longer for coffee beans to grow and evolve. 
As a lover of coffee, Carla likes trying out different varieties of coffee every week, buying from other producers around the world. Her pantry has coffee from Uganda, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Guatemala, and other regions of Brazil as well. After all, each region produces coffee with a unique taste. Uh, brewing methods also influence the taste, but we're going to do the tasting later. Carla's family began working with coffee in the 20th century. Now, why does that sound so long ago? Anyway, coffee itself is much older than that. It was discovered in Ethiopia back in the 15th century. After Ethiopians started to brew it and discovered that the beverage had energizing qualities, they started to sell the commodity to the nearby countries. It is unknown who discovered coffee, but there is a legend that says it was a mountaineer goat herd. He noticed that the goats were eating red cherries that left them more energized, and he decided to try it for himself. It was only around the 17th century that coffee reached Europe through the trade done by Dutch merchants. These guys founded the first coffee shops in Europe. They were based in Amsterdam, but after that, coffee culture spread quickly around the Western world. Today, the world's biggest coffee consumer is the United States. Only the city of New York alone drinks millions of cups of coffee every day. Now, back to Carla's farm. The next stage of coffee production is necessary in order to get the beans out of the cherries. Producers need to do that without compromising the taste of coffee. So there are two ways to do that. One process is called washing, the one that Carla does, and the other is known as a natural process. After picking cherries, Carla washes the beans the way her great-grandfather taught her. First, she'll put the beans in a wet mill. This machine will separate the seeds, also known as the coffee beans, from the fruit. Water is an important part of this process, as it will help to separate good beans from bad ones based on their density. Ripe beans are heavier, so they will sink to the bottom. A washed coffee bean will keep all of the original characteristics of the coffee bean, giving a more intense mouthfeel. Then the beans will need to be fermented for a day or two. Much like with cheese or chocolate, mm, this is the part where coffee will acquire its rich and complex flavor. Some farms will ferment coffee beans for over 30 days. This is what is called a natural process. If you choose coffee that has undergone this process, expect a very fermented-tasting bean, almost cheesy in taste, but not in a bad way, I swear. Now, remember we said that the best coffee farms are located in a dry climate? That's because Carla needs to leave several tons of coffee to dry out in the open air before she continues the process. And no, the beans still aren't ready for consumption. They'll spend three weeks drying, and Carla will rake them regularly so that all the beans can dry evenly. Finally, the beans will go to the roasting stage. This is when coffee is cooked, or should I say when it is baked. Whenever you walk into a coffee shop, you see that coffee beans are brown, right? But that's not their original color. Coffee beans are usually greenish in color and they turn brown only during the roasting process. So it's safe to say that roasting coffee is a science, one that needs precision. Beans are baked at extremely high temperatures, ranging from 365 to 482 degrees Fahrenheit. So roasters have to be pretty careful not to overroast and burn entire batches of coffee. Since a pound of raw specialty coffee can cost up to 20 bucks, there's not a lot of room for error while roasting. Next time you see a light roast coffee, remember that this process highlights traces of sweetness and floral notes, while a dark roast will bring a more chocolatey touch to it. Some countries deliberately over-roast their coffee beans, but this is a cultural option. Italians love extremely dark roasts, so it's common that in their local coffee shops, you'll taste an almost burnt espresso. But hey, it was Italians' love for strong coffee that gave the world the mocha pot. The mocha pot was invented around 1933, and it is like a mini espresso machine. It's a home brewing method that will let you have a drink that is similar to espresso, but is a more watered-down version of it. 
Now, not all coffee producers roast their own coffee. A lot of farms sell their green beans to roasteries around the world. And hey, maybe your favorite local coffee shop is also a coffee roaster, so you'll always get freshly roasted coffee. Here at Carla's, they do their own roasting. To taste which roast they'll sell, they do something called cupping. This is when grounded beans are immersed in water and professional tasters evaluate the coffee's taste, aroma, and mouthfeel to determine its quality. Here's the catch. They don't actually drink this coffee. They just let it sit in their mouths and spit it into another cup. Okay? Since you're a coffee expert now, let's do some serious tasting. We need to pour the liquid into the cup first. So, how can we do that? We can try out different brewing methods. You can try pour-over methods for vibrant flavors but less bitterness. If you don't mind the natural bitterness, try some pressure methods like the espresso machine, the AeroPress, or even the mocha pot. If you're one of those people who love your coffee cold, how about a cold brew? Everything depends on the taste you're looking for. Well, that's it. Our coffee tour is over. But hey, next time you think that paying 5 or 6 bucks for a cup of specialty espresso is too much, remember how long the entire process takes and how many people are involved in delivering that tiny bit of liquid into your cup. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Your heart is racing. You're running for your life from one of the biggest creatures you've ever seen. A giant reptile on two legs sprinting right behind you. You hear the sound of a raging river next to you, but decide not to jump in. Thick leaves and bushes keep blocking your path, and you keep getting stuck in the mud. Everything around you is out to get you, and there's nowhere to hide. You spot a hollowed-out tree trunk and crawl inside. Whatever's out there is getting closer and closer. You hear deep guttural breathing and huge stomping. It's getting closer. You see a large tail from a crack in the tree trunk, swinging and knocking down bushes and small trees. Whatever it is, it's sniffing you out like those dogs at the airport. And right next to your face are giant bugs the size of a house cat. Perfect. You've always been scared to even look at crawly little things. But this one's so close and so big, you can actually see its facial features. It's looking at you like you're the alien. You want to scream, but can't. Then, out of the darkness, more bugs. They're curious things, flicking their antennas all over your body. Okay, this is too much. A bug is one thing, but now a giant centipede thing is crawling your way. Its fangs are the size of your thumb. You dart out of the tree trunk and come face to face with a giant monster. It stops and stares at you, knowing you have no place to go. Claws and teeth the size of bowling pins. That's enough to keep you up at night. It's getting ready to charge right at you. Welcome to the most dangerous period and area in history for a human, the Mid-Cretaceous Sahara. This place was thriving around 100 million years ago in what would now be North Africa. Back then, the continents were all arranged differently, and the weather was wild. Extreme storms were pretty common, and temperatures would rise and fall like a Mexican wave at a soccer stadium. Then, sea levels started to rise. Water flooded the Kem Kem region, an area between modern-day Algeria and Morocco. Over the next millions of years, asteroids, volcanic eruptions, and other natural disasters wiped out everything else. Bye-bye, dinosaurs. Thanks for playing. You probably think of the Sahara as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. But back when it had trees and rivers, it was even more dangerous. The famous River of Giants was a huge river system that stretched from modern-day Egypt all the way to Morocco. The land was flat, and not much vegetation grew there, but it was enough for life to exist. Frightening, scary life! That creature you're staring at? It's a giant, scary-looking theropod, and it's out to get you! Imagine a T-Rex-like dinosaur that's more than 32 feet tall and has an epic jawline. 
<laughs> Scary stuff. They were the top dogs in the food chain back then. And that's why this place and period in history was so unique. The entire area had an incredible imbalance between hungry dinos and poor little dino snacks. There wasn't enough food to go around. Scientists were never able to find much evidence of herbivores. That means it might have been a royal rumble of carnivorous creatures waiting to pounce on each other at any moment. So, after a while of having a stare-down contest with a giant theropod, a shadow creeps up on you from behind. You're too scared to turn around, but the growling is louder than anything you've ever heard. It shakes you to the core. You turn around and see a Spinosaurus. And that's about all you can see. You know how they always show the T-Rex as the king of the dinosaurs? Well, this one would be, what, the emperor? It stands about 50 feet tall and has a sail of scales on its back, the size of a regular human. Then add in a crocodile-style snout with razor-sharp teeth and some short, powerful legs. Its diet mainly consists of river fish, but it's looking at you like you're a delicious fish taco. The two alphas are now in a standoff, with you stuck in the middle. But before you close your eyes and get ready to be eaten, they begin fighting each other, knocking down trees. You tiptoe your way out of there and run! The further you go, the better, right? Wrong. Not here, because everywhere you go, there's going to be something dangerous. During this period, there was danger in the sky, in the water, and on land. There were small mammals scurrying around here and there, but they mostly stayed in the shadows to avoid danger. After five minutes of running as fast as humanly possible, you may get out of the forest and onto an open plain. Bad move. Now there's nowhere to hide. Suddenly, you hear another shriek. You look behind you. Nothing. It's just short grass everywhere. Then you tilt your head up to the sky and see what looks like a giant bird. Only these are technically flying crocodiles. There were plenty of huge pterosaurs that ruled the skies. Alanqua saharica was a flying reptile that may have eaten fish in the river. Those fish must have been tasty. It had a huge wingspan and long slender jaws. Oh, and it was the size of a small bus. This one found you and is racing down to catch you. You run for your life, again. And this time, there's no place to hide. Suddenly, you feel talons grasping onto you and you're lifted off the ground. You soar up. If you weren't scared out of your mind, you might have noticed how beautiful the giant river channels below you are. The Alonqua maneuvers like a fighter jet, headed for the mountains, dodging all obstacles. You see a large nest with some mini beasts in it. They're hungry and as large as you. Not a great combination. You try to break free, but it's impossible. The creature drops you in the middle of the nest and flies off. You try to cover yourself, but the little ones keep pecking away. It's only a matter of time before it's too late. You look down below you and see the river. You can't tell how deep it is, but it's got a really strong current. You're out of options. You dive into the raging river and get dragged along with the current. Safe for now, ish. Imagine it's 2021. You're walking along one of the hottest and driest places on Earth, the middle of the Sahara Desert, only to find fossils of oversized fish. They ranged from bite size to bus size. Even freshwater sharks lived there. These weren't your average little fishies. Judging by their teeth, those guys meant business. You might even find a giant sea turtle swimming around. Okay, back to your wacky adventure. Luckily, you wash up on a safe sandy part of the river where you're able to relax. You drink some river water and try to find a safe place to make camp. Every noise you hear makes you jump. You sit down and try to enjoy the calmness of ancient earth. Just when you feel you can finally catch your breath, you see a Spinosaurus walking along the river on the prowl. You run off and hide under a bush. It passes you by. You're safe. Or not. It turns, shakes the bushes, and sees you. Just then, a large boom scares it away. It's the sound of you jolting awake. You turn on the light and see your cat staring at you. Those dinosaurs seem so real, probably because of that documentary you were watching right before bed. 
the entire mid-Cretaceous ecosystem depended on rivers for daily life. Just like all ancient civilizations, rivers were essential for the creatures of the time. And very recently, scientists discovered a new species of snakes that went extinct back then, with no known descendants. To understand these ancient ecosystems, it's important to know a lot about fossils. You might find two different fossils side by side, but those animals might have lived millions of years apart. We've all been afraid of the dark at some point in our lives, haven't we? I mean, do you remember getting tucked into bed by your mom or dad after they read you some scary fairy tale with monsters and dragons or even dinosaurs? But just as your parents were about to turn the lights off and silently step out of your room, you remembered. What if there was something hiding under your bed? Or worse, what if some spooky creature was stuck somewhere in the closet? You could probably get up and check, but it was too dark out there. Wouldn't it be great to have some source of light that would come from within your body? You could always use it whenever you get surrounded by darkness. Unfortunately, as humans, we aren't able to do that. But there are a bunch of creatures out there that can, in fact, light themselves up. That's thanks to a little something scientists call bioluminescence. Animals and fish living in the ocean tend to have this talent more often than others. And you can find these creatures anywhere close to the surface or deep down at the bottom. 2.5 miles deep if you have a knack for numbers. These creatures use their light for a lot of things, like communicating with other members of their species, luring in prey, and even scaring away enemies. Bioluminescence is basically an organism's ability to emit its own light. Chemistry has a lot to do with it. Such animals use two chemicals, one called luciferin, and the other called luciferase. Add a bit of oxygen and BAM! Light! Should you ever wonder if you actually observe bioluminescence or if someone just dropped a glow stick in the ocean, be on the lookout for neon blue, green, or even red sparkles in the sea. They're usually spread over a large area. This can even make the water look like glitter or a starry sky. You can thank squid, tiny crustaceans, and algae for this romantic atmosphere. Now, I've got another unusual phenomenon for you. How about a golden waterfall? I'm not kidding, it actually exists, and it's a natural phenomenon. To see it, you have to drive to Yosemite National Park to the Horsetail Fall. Make sure to plan your trip in winter or early spring. That's the only time during the year when you can see this awesome phenomenon. It doesn't need any scientific explanation. It's nothing more than sunlight at dusk hitting the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava, or gold, your choice. That's the reason why during this time of year, the horsetail fall is also named the firefall. Unfortunately, this phenomenon is becoming less and less visible within the years, mostly because of drought and other issues connecting with the melting of snow. So, should you ever decide to visit, Keep an eye on the waterfall, since the effect is very brief. Ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? It's also called volcanic lightning. Apparently, specialists looking into the phenomenon have yet to fully grasp what it is. When a regular thunderstorm happens, particles with positive and negative charges collide, hence the giant spark we call lightning. It also makes a lot of noise, which you can recognize as thunder. But when a volcano is erupting, some of the volcanic ash particles get electrically charged, and while getting projected into the air with a huge force, they collide and cause electrical discharges. This whole process makes it look like there's lightning coming from the volcano itself. Imagine all that ash, gas, and smoke coming from the crater, and then add some electricity to the mix. It'll make the whole picture look really bizarre. No wonder this phenomenon is called the dirty thunderstorm. Now, how about clouds that look like waves? Those are called Asparitas clouds, and they're actually quite close to the ground, unlike your regular day-to-day -day clouds. The name comes from the word aspero, which in Latin translates to rough or uneven. On rare occasion, you may spot such clouds when the weather is calm, but they're mostly associated with thunderstorms. 
These clouds appear during unstable atmospheric conditions, and surprisingly, they don't produce rain. Even though they do resemble dark storm-like clouds, they also create random patterns, tricking your eyes into thinking you're looking at the surface of the sea from under the water. Another impressive kind of cloud is called mammatus clouds. What makes them so special is a series of bulges emerging from the base of each cloud. One such cloud enters a level in the atmosphere where the wind direction changes. You can see these wave-like patterns in the sky. Australia is the place for you if you like surfing, but not all the waves you can catch there are made of water. Near a town called Hayden, there's a mysterious wave made out of rocks. This granite formation supposedly dates back to 2.63 billion years ago. That's way before dinosaurs started hanging around the planet. Standing at 49 feet high and 360 feet long, the wave was formed as a result of two processes, weathering and erosion. There's softer sediment at the base of the wave rock, which was chemically weathered by groundwater. Winds and rain did the rest of the job, causing the erosion of the rest of the formation. Its red, yellow, and gray stripes are made of iron hydroxide, carbonates, and other chemical compounds that were washed down by the rain. You've made it to Australia, so stick around a bit more. There's one more location here that seems unreal. You'll need to fly over this one, however, if you want the best picture. In the western part of the country, surrounded by green woodlands, there's a series of lakes. They're all a staggering shade of bright pink. Out of them all, the most famous is Lake Hillier, a 2,000-foot-long reservoir. It's surrounded by both sand and a forest of eucalyptus trees. This makes the cartoon-like hue of the lake stand out even more. One of the many theories explaining the color of these mysterious lakes is connected with algae. These algae appear to gather high levels of a substance called beta-carotene, which has a red-orange pigment in it. Another explanation involves haloarchaea. Those are microorganisms that sometimes look red. Even if you don't enjoy flying, the lakes are great for taking a swim. They're not toxic, even though they have loads of salt in them. This means you'll be able to stay afloat easily, and the water won't damage your swimsuit. During winter up north in Canada, a bizarre phenomenon happens at Lake Abraham in Alberta. Underneath the frozen surface, you can spot some weird objects that look like frozen jellyfish. It's definitely not the case, as these creepy formations are just frozen methane bubbles. Those are pockets of gas that were trapped underwater and got stuck there after the lake had frozen. They appear when leaves and grass fall into the water and bacteria digest them. This process transforms them into methane. This phenomenon is as beautiful and strange as it is dangerous. The pockets of methane can easily become highly flammable. When the temperatures rise during the spring, the ice melts and these bubbles start popping and fizzing. It's a spectacular sight to observe. Picture a lake filled with soda. Remember not to bring any source of fire. It can be very dangerous for visitors. You can check out these types of lakes all across Canada's Banff National Park. Nature often tends to make its own music. Just listen to the sound of crickets at night or the soothing noise of a waterfall. But in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, there's a strange geological phenomenon which takes nature soundtracks to a completely different level. These are called the ringing rocks, and scientists still can't explain their unusual behavior. If you strike these rocks with a heavy object, like a hammer or another rock, the stones will make a ringing sound, as if they were hollow, but they're not. What makes the ringing rocks even more bizarre, apart from the mysterious sound they make, is that no animal wants to hang around there. Even though the rocks are surrounded by a thick forest, scientists haven't managed to trace any animal activity in the area yet. Even more striking is the fact that despite all the trees around the rocks, you won't find any leaves lying on the boulders. What makes these rocks so unappealing for both animals and vegetation is still up for debate. It was September 12, 1990. 
In those times, way before instant messaging and Zoom calls, a little girl was looking for pen pals. Zoe was aboard a ship from England to Belgium on vacation with her parents. She was only 10 years old at the time, but was a very clever schoolgirl. She took a piece of paper and started putting some words together. She introduced herself, Hello. then wrote about how she liked ballet and playing the flute and the piano. Of course, she couldn't help but mention her two adored pets, Aww. a little hamster she called Sparkle and her fish Speckle. She also put down the address at which she could be reached in case someone was interested in writing back to her. But alas, she was at sea. Oh. Who could she send this message to? Hmm. An interesting idea came to her mind. Hmm. She carefully placed her letter in a plastic bottle, tightly closed the lid to protect it from the water, and threw it into the sea. The little girl's excitement faded away over the years as she didn't receive a response. Maybe the bottle got stuck somewhere. Maybe it was swallowed by some big, scary sea creature. Or maybe the water actually poked through the plastic cap and destroyed her message. Many years later, on Christmas, a letter for Zoe was received at her parents' house under her maiden name. The postage signaled that the message was from Europe. It was from a Dutch couple, Pete and Jacqueline Leteau, who had found her delicate bottle and were very considerate to write back. They pointed out that they had found the letter among the debris thrown at the shore by the sea. Zoe's letter had been stranded for a staggering 23 years at sea and traveled for more than 350 miles to reach its final destination near Rotterdam in the Netherlands. That's quite a voyage for a small plastic bottle. A story similar to that of Zoe is the strange connection between two little boys. A little German boy named Frank Uzbek was on a boat traveling to Denmark when he got the same idea as Zoe. He was five years old at the time he put together a message and threw it into the unknown. The year was 1987. He got his response years later, when he was 29. His letter, just like the one Zoe would send a couple of years later, had been at sea for 24 years. His message was found by a boy named Daniel Korotkin while he was on a walk with his parents on the Koronian Spit near the Baltic Sea. Danielle was lucky that his father knew enough German to translate the message. The unlikely friends eventually met via video call in 2011. Not all message-in-a-bottle stories have been explained away. In 2013, a Croatian surfer came across a damaged bottle while near the Adriatic Sea. The message it contained dated back to 1985, and it was from a man named Jonathan. The sender was eager for his letter to reach a woman named Mary, and he also expressed his keenness for her to respond. Since the letter was supposedly sent from Nova Scotia, the bottle had to have traveled a mind-boggling 3,700 miles. The message went from the Atlantic Ocean, entered the Mediterranean Sea, and reached the Adriatic shores in Croatia. The identities of neither John nor Mary were ever discovered. There are also messages in a bottle with wonderful love stories to share. This was the case for Ake and Paulina Wiking. When Ake, a lonely Swedish sailor, placed a letter in a bottle and threw it in the Mediterranean Sea, he had no idea the piece of paper would eventually reach his future wife. This was in the early 1950s. The bottle was found by an Italian man who was inspired enough to give it to his niece, Paulina. After a year of back-and-forth letters being exchanged, Aki and Paulina eventually met and got married. Having decided to share their story with the world, they became somewhat of a celebrity couple for the time. They even shared video footage of their wedding with the world, and their story was featured in a bunch of newspapers. This fortunate event started a movement between young people looking for love, increasing the number of messages being thrown out at sea in search of a fairy tale ending. Not all the stories that started out like this eventually worked out, though. In 1945, an American named Frank Heostak placed a similar message to that of Aki's in a bottle and threw it in the waters. Almost a year later, his letter was found by an Irish woman. Her name was Brenda O'Sullivan. Their years of correspondence soon caught the attention of the media at the time, but their friendship never flourished because of the added pressure. They eventually met in person when Frank traveled to Ireland, but he didn't stay for long, and they eventually got out of touch with each other. After Titanic met its strange ending, many bottles containing secret messages started to surface. 
Almost all of them proved to be counterfeited, apart from one letter. Years after Titanic had sunk in the icy Atlantic waters, a bottle was found on the Irish shores. It was supposedly from a man named Jeremiah Burke, and to this day, it is considered to be the only genuine message in a bottle originating from Titanic. The piece of paper simply stated the sender's name and the location, the Titanic, accompanied by the word goodbye. Since the date has washed away, it's difficult to estimate whether the note was sent before or after the ship had hit the iceberg. The common understanding is, however, that since Jeremiah was looking to relocate to the U.S., he was merely sending his last symbolic regards to his family and friends back in Ireland. This simple way of meeting and sometimes corresponding with people has turned into a hobby for a man from a Canadian province named Prince Edward Island, located east of the U.S. state of Maine. This man, Harold Hackett, claims to have sent over 4,000 bottles into the Atlantic Ocean since 1996. He also claims to have received many responses from all over the world, including letters from people in Europe, like France and Germany, but also from the Bahamas or even Africa. This unlikely pastime earns him about 150 Christmas cards from his pen pals each year. To this day, he refuses to add his phone number to any of his letters. This way, he ensures that if people ever want to contact him, the only means of doing so is via a written letter. He's also studied the best times to send the messages in the water based on the direction of the winds and the currents. Now, some bottles spend a whole lifetime at sea after being cast away by their sender. It was the case for a British man that wrote a message and placed it into a bottle before throwing it in the English Channel in 1914. His name was Thomas Hughes, and he wanted to direct the message to his wife, but was polite enough to write a letter to whoever got their hands on the bottle first, asking them to redirect the piece of paper accordingly. The bottle didn't reach his wife, since it was found 85 years later on the Essex coast. The man that stumbled upon the bottle was kind enough to reach out to the family and place the message in possession of Thomas's daughter. And 85 years isn't the longest time for a small bottle to be cruising the waves. A scientist named Hunter Brown was studying currents in the North Sea when this idea came to his mind. He placed the same message in almost 2,000 bottles and requested the unlikely recipient that they write back with the location of their discovery. He thought this method would help him better understand the layout of the North Sea currents. A bottle was found about 11 miles from its original departing location after 97 years. To this day, more than 300 of the original bottles relating to Hunter Brown's project eventually made it to the shore. Not all of the messages that were found in bottles got replied to via physical letters. Oliver Van de Valle threw a bottle containing a letter on the English coast while he was on vacation with his family. He was 14 at the time. 33 years later, a woman reached out on Facebook claiming she had gotten his message and tracked him down through his social media profile. Hmm. At first, he hardly remembered having placed the letter in the bottle, but he eventually recounted the events, <laughs> even the fact that he sealed the bottle with candle wax to make sure it was leak-proof. And then there's Christina Aguilera and her bottle. No, wait, hers is about a genie in a bottle. Okay, never mind. This hidden village is called Algashima. It's located right in the middle of a volcanic crater. You can find it to the south of Japan, in northernmost Micronesia. The story goes that a volcano erupted in the Philippine Sea in the 1780s, causing a lot of harm to a nearby community. Half of the population managed to escape the massive eruption and came back years later to rebuild their village. At the moment, about 160 people are living there peacefully even though the volcano is still considered to be active. Huacachina in Peru lies in one of the driest climates in the world. And still, it's a beautiful town, surrounded by lush palm trees. It also has a lagoon, which is said to have special healing properties. The settlement has a little over 90 residents that manage small businesses. Most of them use sand as their primary resource. Some offer sandboarding services or even provide luxury dinners in the desert. 
for over 500 years, a small group of people has been living on a cliffside of a peak called the Green Mountain. It's one of the most remote places in Oman and in the whole world. The only way to reach the settlement is on foot, by mule, or by all-terrain vehicle. It's called Al Sogara, and you need to hike around 20 minutes up a steep stone staircase to get there. The village appeared back when the locals chiseled their houses into the mountain stone to protect themselves from storms and the cold. Five families of the Al Sharaki tribe still call this place home, about 25 people in total. A lot of other villages like this one can be found in the region, but Al Sogara is special because it's the only one that is still inhabited. Up until 14 years ago, there wasn't even electricity or telephone lines here. The nearest road you could drive on was nine miles away. Since there were no schools, people had to learn how to read and write at home from their elders. To this day, the villagers continue their traditional practice of building their homes by carving them directly into the mountain rock. One of the most beautiful Greek gems is Monimbasia, a castle town located in southeastern Peloponnese. It was designed to be invisible from the mainland for added protection. You can only see it from the sea. And to reach it, you need to follow a narrow pathway that connects it to the mainland. That's actually how its name came into being. It translates to a single passage. Monimbasia was built in the Middle Ages, exclusively carved in the mountain rock. These days, a lot of old mansions have been turned into guest houses and boutique hotels. Not only is the architecture amazing and beautifully preserved, but it's also surrounded by crystal clear waters. A town with no roads? Pack your bags for Gietorn in the Netherlands, if you don't mind traveling by boat. The town is very peaceful, probably because everyone here travels by canals. Even the mail gets delivered by water. Since there's no car traffic and people rarely move around, the town is really quiet. So quiet that the loudest sound one can hear is the quacking of a duck every now and then. It initially started as a movie set, but Hobbiton in New Zealand still exists, even after the filming of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit was finished. Tours to the charming set town are now available. There are 44 Hobbit holes in total, though only a few of them are actually open to the public. The isolated cliffside village of Gasa Dalar in the Faroe Islands has a population of only 11 people. It's mostly known for its scenic waterfall, which falls directly into the Atlantic Ocean. You could only reach it on foot, hiking through the mountains not so long ago. However, a tunnel has been constructed recently, making the place easily accessible by car. The 1980s musical Popeye had a custom set built on Malta. It wasn't taken down after the filming had been finished. And Popeye Village is now home to groups of beautifully colored wooden buildings and a company of actors. There's a lot of fun stuff to do there, like watch theater shows, go on boat rides, visit museums, or simply explore the creative village. The oldest and most photographed village in Austria is called Hallstatt. It's a hidden European gem with beautifully preserved old buildings and a subterranean salt lake. It's also home to a museum with artifacts as old as 7,000 years and the world's oldest salt mine. Fort Bortange in the Netherlands is a small establishment shaped like a star. Creative parts aside, it was built this way for defensive purposes. It gave the guards of the fort a strategic advantage because they had a perfect 360-degree view. These days, the construction is perfectly preserved, including its old buildings, cobblestone streets, wooden windmills, and sophisticated bridges. In Morocco, there's a traditional earthen village made entirely from clay bricks. You can find it in a valley close to the Atlas Mountains, 32 miles from the capital of Morocco. Merchants who followed the Trans-Saharan trade route went through this town, carrying spices and gold. As the trade route became less and less popular, many of these fortresses were abandoned and are now preserved relics. It's one of the best places for skiing in the world, but it's still hidden from the public. 
No wonder the locals call it the secret side of the valley. Located in Austria, the tiny village of Varth has only a couple hundred inhabitants. Not only is it the snowiest village on Earth, but it also has access to one of the biggest ski slopes in the world. Its popularity increased a bit in 2013, when the construction of a high-speed road was completed nearby. Birano, in Italy, is one of the most colorful islands in the world. Because of its vibrant colors, it almost looks tropical. It features emerald green waters, beautiful houses, and a 17th century bell tower. Its lace-making tradition brought Leonardo da Vinci to the island back in the 1400s. He bought a piece of cloth there and later used it for the design of the famous Dome of Milan. If you have a UK passport, you must be familiar with the beautiful small town of Bybury, as its scenery is featured in your ID. It's surely one of the most charming towns in Europe, as it's made up of stone buildings standing on the River Colne. The image in the UK passports is that of Arlington Row, a line of weaver's cottages that date back to the 14th century. The town of Cooper Pedy in Australia is partially underground. It all began back in 1915, when opal deposits were found in the area. To this day, the town is still the biggest opal mine in the world. People living there figured out that it would be more comfortable for them to stick to the underground, as the temperatures outside can reach 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So, the settlement now has underground stores and galleries. Cooper Pedy is also home to the world's first four-star underground hotel. To visit the most remote location in the whole world, you'll need to prepare yourself for quite a journey. If you're traveling from the United States, for example, the easiest route is a 15-hour long flight to Cape Town, South Africa, followed by a six-day boat ride. Only after that will you reach Tristan de Cunha. Or you can take a month-long cruise across the South Atlantic Ocean, whatever works better for you. Planning in advance is a must, since there are only nine boat trips to the island yearly. The island itself is just seven miles long. Sitting right in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, it covers a mere 37.8 square miles. The 300 residents are all farmers. They have the internet, but it's really slow. As for a phone network or a local newspaper, neither is available. The inhabitants of the island speak a dialect of English that is used by the smallest number of people in the world. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hey, check it out! You could technically live in the Eiffel Tower if you don't mind residing in a small apartment. Gustav Eiffel designed the tower to feature a private apartment for himself right at the top of the construction. He left the place all neat and tidy with all the necessary furniture. These days, the apartment is home to two mannequins, that of Eiffel himself and his equally famous friend Thomas Edison. A sneak peek at the apartment is available for tourists who purchase a ticket to the top of the tower. If you ever pass through Trafalgar Square, you'll surely miss London's smallest police station, since it's hidden beneath a lamppost. The reason why it was placed there back in 1926 was to let police officers be close to public rallies. They happen quite a lot in that area. Some even said it used to have a direct phone line to Scotland Yard. It's now used as a cleaning station, so there isn't much to see there apart from some moths. Grand Central Station, one of New York's busiest, has a great hidden activity for travelers. There are tennis courts available in a secret space named the Annex. This area used to host a lot of different things back in the day, from a recording studio to an art gallery. These days, though, the location is known as the Vanderbilt Tennis Club and can be visited by the public. Similar to Mr. Eiffel, Producer Samuel Lionel Roxy Roxafel designed a hidden apartment for himself in the Radio City Music Hall in New York City. He also asked for the apartment, now called the Roxy Suite, to be decorated in the Art Deco style. It features 20-foot-high ceilings covered in gold leaf and walls with floor-to-ceiling plush drapes. These days, only Radio City performers and VIP guests can visit the location. You might be able to rent it out, too, but they say the prices are very high. 
Rome's best-known symbol, the Colosseum, has secret tunnels hidden beneath its grounds. Back in the day, ancient Romans used these passageways to keep wild animals, like lions, tigers, elephants, and bears, as they were used for gladiator fights and other types of entertainment. They've been open for visitors since 2010, along with the Colosseum's plumbing system. It was quite the technological advancement for the time, featuring drinking fountains and even toilets. There are some people that have criticized the opening of these secret tunnels. They believe it might affect the building's structure, given the huge traffic of visitors. The Empire State Building is said to have 102 floors, but that's not true. It actually has a secret 103rd floor. The way to access it is through a hidden staircase located on the 102nd floor. But it's mostly available for the building's engineers and celebrities from time to time. That's not all. The 103rd floor leads to the Empire State Building's capsule. It's the building's famous dome. One of the most famous American landmarks features a mysterious hidden chamber. If current records are true, there's a secret room behind Abraham Lincoln's head from Mount Rushmore. It was meant to keep relative artifacts and documents of American history, like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We now know these important documents are kept in another location, and the Mount Rushmore room remains inaccessible to the public to this day. Like maybe it's a video game room for park rangers. Or not. Completed between 2550 and 2490 BCE, the Great Pyramid of Giza is the last remaining of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Constructed as a resting place for the 4th dynasty Egyptian pharaoh Khufu, it was thought to feature the Grand Gallery, the King's Chamber, and the Queen's Chamber. But that's not all, as recently, a secret room was discovered here. Dubbed the Big Void, kind of like my head, this huge space is nearly 100 feet long. Its main purpose is still up for debate, but some archaeologists believe it was used as an internal ramp to help build the massive structure. Cinderella Castle is the main attraction of Disney World in Orlando, Florida, in an area called the Magic Kingdom. It does have a hidden room of its own, dubbed the Cinderella Suite. The suite was originally intended to host Walt Disney himself and his family. He passed away in 1966, and he never got to see the final result. It was finally finished in 2006, and ever since, it's only been open a limited number of times and only for visitors invited by the Disney company. Grand Central isn't the only station with hidden features. Italy has its own Milano Centrale, the country's second-largest railway station. More than 320,000 passengers pass by these walls every day. But most of them never notice the closed doors on the sidewall of the station leading to the Royal Pavilion, a fashionable area designed as a waiting room for the royal family. The pavilion features two grand halls divided into two floors with luxurious furniture, styled marble, all decorated with royal sculptures. Now, even the Statue of Liberty has a hidden room. Try to guess where it is? It's in the torch of the statue. Now, unfortunately, it's not available to the public ever since it was completely closed back in 1916. A camera was placed here back in 2011 to allow people to enjoy live streaming of the panoramic view. A statue of Leonardo da Vinci, located at Rome's da Vinci Airport, was first unveiled back in 1960. It recently went under renovation. One of the workers made a mysterious discovery during this process. A small hole, somewhere in the middle of the statue, at about 30 feet. When it was carefully opened, two parchments were found inside. Written in classical Latin, the first document told the story of the area that now houses the airport. The other one provided a list of people who attended the inauguration of the statue. The U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C has a secret sports facility where clerks, off-duty police officers, and other Supreme Court employees can play basketball. The court, located on the top floor of the building, is obviously dubbed the highest court in the land. <laughs> Excuse me while I dribble. Disneyland's Club 33 is located in the New Orleans Square section of the theme park in Anaheim, California. This exclusive club houses only 500 members and it was inaugurated in 1967. It aimed to entertain celebrities, politicians, and sponsors. 
the decorations were courtesy of Walt Disney himself and his wife. Services here come at a hefty price. Members have to pay $25,000 to join the club, and later a yearly fee of between $12,000 to $25,000. The entrance to the club was easy to miss, since it was hidden behind a doorway with a single gold plate that had the number 33 engraved on it. A makeover of the club took place in 2014. They moved the entrance to an even more secret location, but people can still see the old one in its original place. The New York City public libraries have hidden apartments, too. Employees and their families could stay in those hidden rooms that are placed above many of the public libraries. Most of them are either closets or empty rooms these days, but some of them are available to the public, like those belonging to the $4.4 million renovation project of the apartment in the Washington Heights branch. It was transformed from an old, dusty, 3,750-square-foot space into a dedicated teen area and tech center that also features rooms for adult education programs. Cool! That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. So imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered today you start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. 
with whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siebel, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, Scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. 
The information shows that instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. It was April 10th, 1912. Richard had just departed from Southampton, England, aboard the most famous ship of the time, dubbed the Unsinkable. Since he had just witnessed a near collision with the SS City of New York, he decided to write to his wife and report the unfortunate and frightening event. My dearest Sal, he wrote, we got away yesterday after a lot of trouble. Little did he know that a mere four days later, both his pen and the ship he was on would be lost forever at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Was this some sort of bad omen? Did Richard actually foresee what was about to happen to the ship he was on? In case you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Richard Geddes was aboard the Titanic on the day that he wrote the letter to his wife. On April 14, 1912, the ship seemed to have been lost forever. Along with it, so many secrets and treasures have settled at the bottom of the ocean. It took until 1985 for the Titanic's wreck to be finally rediscovered using state-of-the-art sonar technology. Ever since then, they've managed to recover thousands of items from the Titanic, and many of them went on display or auction. Things like jewelry, a life jacket, a menu from the ship's restaurant, or even a sample square of carpet from the first-class stateroom have all captivated the public's attention, just like the many stories of the people on board. Scientists have even tried to come up with strategies to get the Titanic back up altogether to properly study it and stop it from getting more and more damaged at the bottom of the ocean. Some have suggested filling the wreck with ping-pong balls to make it float, while others even considered injecting it with 180,000 tons of Vaseline. Another idea was to use 450,000 tons of liquid nitrogen to trap it in an iceberg that would float to the surface. But they eventually had to let go of all these potential strategies, since the Titanic is way too fragile to ever be recovered. The Titanic may be one of the most interesting ships lying at the bottom of the ocean, at least in popular culture, but deep sea divers have a lot of other stories to share. Planes also sometimes find their way to the bottom of the ocean. Deep sea divers in Oahu, Hawaii came across the wreckage of an F4U Corsair plane. It seems to have crashed into the ocean in 1946, as it didn't have sufficient fuel. If you can dive deep enough, you might even stumble upon statues and lost artifacts, like those found in the world's only underwater archaeological park off the coast of Naples, Italy. It features the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Baia. The underwater statues found here are breathtaking, to say the least. In an ironic twist of events, some of the equipment we intended to use to get us to the moon was lost at the bottom of the sea for a very long time. But how did that happen? Beginning from the late 1960s and ending in the early 70s, many Apollo rockets were launched to orbit the Earth and the moon. When reaching altitudes of about 38 miles, the first portion of the spacecraft, including the engines, needed to separate. People thought these components got destroyed or lost forever. But were they really? In 2012, a team of specialists discovered a bunch of rocket engines 14,000 feet off the coast of Florida. They have since gone through a two-year renovation plan and are now on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Can you imagine stumbling upon a whole city underwater? Back in 2001, a lost city was discovered in the Gulf of Cambay off the coast of India. Some archaeologists believe it to be the oldest city in history. By comparison, it's almost the size of Manhattan and features massive walls and even plazas. They stumbled upon pieces of sculpture, artwork, and even what looked like ancient wooden furniture, believed to date back up to 9,500 years ago and 5,000 years older than any city previously discovered. Okay, how about an underwater river? I can't even imagine what that would look like. But some deep divers claim to have seen it south of Tulum, Mexico. Is that even possible? 
Well, not really, since the Cenote Angelita Cave is not a true river, but a very special type of optical illusion. It's formed by a halocline, meaning a cloud of hydrogen sulfide at the bottom of this underwater cave. Turns out you can actually swim right through this cloud, which makes you feel like you're swimming through a flowing body of water. Not all things discovered underwater are inanimate objects. Some of them are actually quite scary sea creatures. A jellyfish might not be on your list of things to look out for if you can avoid the stings. But this giant one, also known as a lion's mane jellyfish, is the largest known species of its kind. In all fairness, you'll only uncover it if you happen to dive into the waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. You surely won't miss it, since it stretches across 120 feet from the top to the bottom of its tentacles. When it comes to deep sea diving, a lot of people are looking to discover some lost treasure. One diver was lucky enough to have hit the literal jackpot when he came upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure on the bottom of the seabed. That was back in 2015, when this lucky diver was swimming just off the coast of Florida. What did he find, you might ask? Well, about 51 gold coins, 40 feet of gold chain, and a rare single coin that was tailored for the King of Spain, Philip V. Speaking of people looking for lost treasures, divers also sometimes found pirate ships. They discovered one of these pirate shipwrecks in 2015 off the coast of Colombia. It dates back to the 18th century. The value of this forgotten ship was estimated to be between $4 billion and $17 billion, as it contained treasures, precious stones, gold, and countless other really valuable items. By comparison, a whole island in the Bahamas is up for grabs at $75 million. A computer is the last thing you'd ever expect to discover underwater, right? And this was no regular computer, but an ancient one. And yet, Someone stumbled upon it between 1900 and 1901 on the spot of a shipwreck located off one Greek island. Researchers believe this weird stone contraption to be the earliest form of a computer. It was designed to serve many purposes, such as predicting astronomical positions and eclipses on the calendar. Since humanity lost most of the technology used back then, it was wonderful to rediscover it so many years later. It let us piece together many of the ancient Greeks' accomplishments. The computer is now at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, should you ever want to check it out in person. This has to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the Earth's oceans. We really don't know how deep it is, since it's so difficult to measure. But it's somewhere around 7 miles deep, and 5 times longer than the Grand Canyon. They first studied this massive underwater hole back in 1875 using a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director named James Cameron reached the bottom of the trench in the submersible vessel Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet call this place their home, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench took its name after the nearby Mariana Islands which are named Las Marianas in honor of the Spanish queen, Mariana of Austria. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Urbania sounds like a made-up city from a fairy tale, but it's not. It's real and located in central Italy. The town's name isn't the only strange thing about it. Every year, the local newspaper and television publish a strange weather forecast. It's based on onion wedges. Yes, you've heard it correctly. Italians from this region eagerly look forward to a forecast based on a vegetable. The tradition dates back to the Middle Ages. It's kept alive by the local school teacher. Every January 24th, she cuts a yellow onion into quarters. Then she divides them into wedges. 12 of them for each month of the year. They lie neatly on her kitchen cutting board, facing east. The following morning, the onion is ready for interpretation. Because she sprinkled them with salt, the wedges change their texture. The woman uses these clues to forecast the weather for that year. She's been doing this for three decades. And before her, her father did it. Before him, her grandfather. 
you get the gist. Onion reading has become a family tradition. Historical records show that this practice has been going on in Urbania for centuries. Back in the day, farmers used this method of forecasting the weather to help agriculture. It was important to know exactly when to plant seeds and when to harvest crops. The method must have been accurate because up until the beginning of the 20th century, locals still trusted onions more than the official weather forecast. This isn't surprising. The first weather forecast based on scientific data was published in a British newspaper in 1861. Before this time, people did all sorts of things to predict the weather. The methods they used might seem pretty funny to us today. Take the woolly bear caterpillar as an example. This species lives in the United States and southern Canada. The legend goes that you can determine how harsh the next winter will be just by looking at the animal's color pattern. If the color brown is dominant, then the winter will be mild. That's an odd way to predict the weather, but believe it or not, it does have some grounding in science. You know who entomologists are? Yes, those are scientists who study bugs. Their research showed that the caterpillar's color is connected with how much food it has had. But there's a twist. The color reveals the harshness of the winter of the previous year. Telling the future is not the woolly bear caterpillar's forte. People think ladybugs bring luck, but they're more than good luck charms. Have you ever heard of the saying, when ladybugs swarm, expect a day that's warm? This is actually true. When the weather is warm outside, these lovable insects leave their hiding. But as the temperature drops before a rain shower, they fly in search of cover. Frogs can also predict rain. Right before the first droplet, these amphibians croak louder. They actually do this because they're about to mate. Frogs lay eggs in bodies of fresh water. If rain is coming, then water levels in ponds will rise. This increases the animal's chances of finding a partner to produce tadpoles. Have your parents told you to stay away from hornets' nests? They were right, but the nests of bees, wasps, and hornets make for excellent weather stations. When they start building nests higher than usual, expect a colder winter with a lot of snow. You see, hornets cannot survive temperatures lower than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why they want to stay clear of the cold as much as possible. Another animal that bulks up for winter is the squirrel. Take notice of these cute rodents the next time you go hiking in the late fall. If they seem chubbier than usual, then the winter is gonna be cold. And remember Scrat from Ice Age? The hyperactive squirrel that was constantly chasing after an acorn? When you see a squirrel acting like Scrat, then that's a sure sign of a long winter approaching. The rodents want to stock up before Mother Nature closes the shop. Have you noticed more cobwebs in your house recently? That's just spiders sensing bad weather approaching. Also, if spider webs are larger than usual, then they're trying to catch more prey. That's their way of preparing for a long winter. Livestock prepares for this period by growing thicker fur. If you live in the countryside and notice that sheep are woollier than usual, then it's time to invest in a warm winter jacket. Are there mole hillocks in your backyard? Apart from tripping on them, you can use them as tiny weather stations. The deeper they are, the harsher the winter. Let all those animals rest a bit. Looking at the sky can also tell you the weather. Duh! There's a popular theory that every foggy day in August equals a day of snowfall in winter. Pretty exact math for something that's just a belief. Then there's the moon. Science already knows that it has power over ocean tides. After all, the saying, clear moon, frost soon, has been around for a while. When the moon is shining bright in a cloudless sky, it's going to be chilly the next morning. Looking at clouds also gives hints about the weather. White clouds high in the sky indicate a clear and sunny day. When their color changes to black and they're set lower in the sky, expect rain. The cloud's shape is also revealing. If they're ragged when you look at them from below, open your umbrella. It's gonna rain soon. Remember the onions from the beginning? They're not the only plants that can forecast the weather. In the Ozark Mountains, there is a folklore belief that involves persimmons. 
When you cut in half the seed of this sweet fruit, look for the shape inside. When it resembles a spoon, expect snow that winter. But if you see a fork, then the cold season will be mild. A knife shape and the weather will be windy and icy. This strange prediction based on cutlery has some logic behind it. American persimmons ripen in September and October. It shouldn't be surprising that people use this fruit to inquire about the winter ahead. The United States is the world's second largest producer of apples. That makes it easy to test another theory. If apple trees produce more fruit than usual, then the upcoming winter will be harsh. There are two explanations why this might be true. The first is that apple trees produce more food for the animals. The second is that they want to maximize the number of seeds. Just in case the plants don't get through the cold spell. Walnut trees use a similar tactic. People figured out that walnuts have a thicker outside shell in preparation for a winter colder than usual. The same goes for hickory trees and oaks. Pine cones are more than a table decoration. The phrase, open pine, the weather's fine, says it all. Pine cones open their scales during warm and dry weather. They want to spread their seeds as far as possible. But when the weather takes a turn for the worst, they close them. Cold or damp air won't disperse pine cone seeds very far. Today, no one goes into the forest to see how plump squirrels are, nor do they take out a ruler to measure pine cones. All the info about the weather we need is inside our smartphones and on the internet. In the 1950s, computers took over weather forecasting, and they've been doing it ever since. But inaccurate weather predictions still happen. Long-term weather forecasts are especially challenging. That's because there are so many factors at play. Wind, humidity, temperature, air pressure, and clouds are just the tip of the meteorological iceberg. Although it's just a tradition, Italian onion reading might not be so ridiculous after all. At least the nice lady uses the onions to make soup after everything is said and done. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, 